Okay, so how is everyone today? <laughs> Subdued. <laughs> okay, so today is the 26th. And last time we were talking about linear functions and the last thing we talked about last time was parallel and perpendicular. So what, can someone remind me what parallel is? Okay, that's nearly right. That, that's, that's most of the situations. So lines are parallel when, when either it's the same line twice or the two lines never, they run side by side and never touch each other. So a analytically, most of the time that means that they have the same slope, but what's the other possibility? When neither one of them has a slope. That is to say that they're both vertical. <clears throat> it's reasons like that why some people don't really care for mathematicians, right? <laughs> <laughs> that we always split that hair, okay. So parallel, same slope, is, is when you have a function, the analytic case is same slope because vertical lines are not functions. <clears throat> okay, how about perpendicular? Yeah, the analytic case for functions is that slopes must be negative reciprocals of each other. But generally, there's another possibility for lines. That's, that's true in, per, in perpendicularity. But there's another, another possibility for lines. There's, it's possible for lines to be perpendicular, but their slopes are not negative reciprocals of each other. One has a slope of zero and the other one's undefined. Very good. One's vertical and one's horizontal. Like the, like the x and y axes, for example. <coughs> OK, so any questions about that? OK, so now we're going to talk about uh, just briefly about linear models. So in a math course, well, at least in this math course, model is code. The word model is code for word problem. <laughs> That's what that means. So <clears throat> what that means is that we're going to talk about some some situations and then we're going to just use a, a linear function, essentially. So here's a <clears throat> first situation. I'm going to read it out loud. And <clears throat> then I'll tell you the important things after that. Oh, come on. <clears throat> OK. So a town's population grows linearly. So. That first sentence is definitely a lie. I mean, <laughs> nothing actually does that in the first place. But okay. okay. Uh, in 2004, the population was 6,200. By 2009, the population was 8,100. Okay. So then, then some some further questions are made. Uh, predict the year. Predict the population in a certain year, and also predict the year in which the population will be a certain value. OK? So here's the question. So population, <coughs> population grows linearly, linearly. <coughs> And then in 2004, the population was 6,200. In 2009, the population was 8,100. <clears throat> so now, these, these three statements taken together means that we know the population for all values of time. Because <clears throat> to say that population grows linearly means that it can be modeled by a linear function. And then what, what do each one of these represent? 
Yeah, this is a point that's on the line. And that is a point that's on the line. Once you have two points on the line, once you once you said once you've said the thing is a line, and here I have two points on it, then you know you can determine all points on the line. Okay, so question uh, question one. Predict the population in say <coughs> Two zero one five. Okay, so this is the strategy that we're going to take. <clears throat> we are going to construct a linear function, so find a linear function using using this data <clears throat> okay so normally when we're dealing in the abstract we're just dealing with points um, we call the horizontal axis X and the vertical axis Y However, arguably on this, and that, there's in principle nothing wrong with that on this exercise. But arguably, I would say that there's a better name that we can use for the horizontal axis than x. What do you think would, might be even better? OK. Yeah, how about, how about the symbol we use is t? Why, would, why is t a reasonable choice for the horizontal axis? Uh, yeah, because it represents time. So, so we'll do that. And then normally for the vertical axis, we write y. But maybe let's write something else since it represents something definite. What, how about P? Why, why is P a reasonable choice? Population. Yeah, because it's population. OK. <clears throat> so what we know, we know a point T1, P1. We know one of the points on the line is, is what? Mm-hmm. Very good. So th that's one of the points that's on the line. What's another point that is on the line? So T2, P2. Yeah, 2009. And then 8100. <clears throat> so as the year increases, as the year increases, the population increased. So we're going to draw a line. Will this line be a positively sloping line or a negatively sloping line? A positively sloping line. OK. So whatever it looks like, it ought to look you know, something like, uh, like this. OK, yes? Why do you start with a negative population? <laughs> well, <laughs> so. So let, let's a, that's a good question. Bring it up at the end, please. OK. <laughs> yeah, but, but yes, obviously, that, you know, what, what would that even mean? Or even more interesting, like right here, at this instant, there were zero people, and then suddenly a person was magicked into existence? I, I suppose so. I'm not really sure. <clears throat> and then there's just one person for an amount of time, and then another one? My understanding of this is that's not the way it happens. It takes at least two people to make another person. Whatever. So that's, that's what I meant when I said that the population gr grows linearly. No, it really doesn't. OK. Th that aside, so we want to find a line. What things are we looking for? What, what do we always need when we want to find the equation of a line? Two points will suffice, but we, you, using what, those two points, we always have to find this thing, the slope. So a, a line is its own secant. Okay. Uh, so a point and a slope. So do we have a point? Ah, we have two points, even better. So do we have slope? Yes. So different question. Could, could we determine slope? Yes. yes. Do we have slope? 
No, okay, so that's what we need to do. Okay, so delta t, the change in time, okay, so we need to subtract the t values. So is it t1 minus t2 or t2 minus t1? t2 minus t1. Okay, t2 minus t1. And I'll do that in a moment. And delta p, Right. So then, in fact, it doesn't matter if you do T1 minus T2 or T2 minus T1. That doesn't matter. What does matter, what does matter is that you must perform the subtraction in each coordinate in the same order. So if you did T2 minus T1, it would not be acceptable for you to do P1 minus P2 because these are in the other order, right? The twos don't line up and the ones don't line up. So, so you have to make these compatible. You either switch that one or switch that one. So I'm going I'm to switch the second one. So the difference in times is five years, and the difference in populations is 1900. <coughs> and therefore, we have determined the slope. The slope, that would be delta p divided by delta t, which is 1900, divided by 5, which is 380. So would someone please interpret this number 380? What does that mean in the context of the, of the exercise? The population grows 380 per year. Yes, the population goes up 380 people per year. So, uh, let's find the linear model. So that would be P minus P1 is M T minus T1. Because the T's are behaving like the X's and the P's are behaving like the Y's. So this is like Y minus Y1 is M X minus X1. The M always goes with whatever was in the denominator or whatever you're reckoning as the input. Okay, so then just plugging stuff in now. This would be P minus, now I need to use a point. Which point am I supposed to use? Yeah, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter which one you use. Either one would suffice. So I'm gonna use the one that has slightly smaller numbers. So P minus 6200 is 380 times T minus 2004. Okay, so now I'm gonna just solve for P. So 380 T minus a big number, okay. So that number is 761520. And then now I'm going to add 6200. So P is 755320. Okay, so 755320. Okay. So here's our, our linear model for population and time. Uh, have we answered the question? What was the question? Uh, okay. Yeah, so from here, all that, all that is required is now plug in 2015. So now evaluate at T is two zero one five. So P is three eight zero times two zero one five minus this big number. 
<laughs> and then plugging this into the machine here. Okay, so I'm going to write something. I want you to tell me about it. So what if I wrote, say, P is 7380. So what would you think about this number? Okay, so in the first place, it's probably not the number that you got if you, if you were using your calculator. But I claim that, that this response, a response like this to this exercise, is not just a little bit wrong, it's a lot of bit wrong. <laughs> a lot of bit. <laughs> why, is this, why is this very wrong? Yeah, I mean, look, we said it's a line. And we gave, we gave two years, we gave 2004 and then 2009, and then it went up to 8100. And so now I give a year that's even after 2009, and then I gave you a value that's intermediate between these? No, that couldn't possibly be right. So this, this answer is, is, is arithmetically wrong, but it's also conceptually entirely wrong. Okay? Okay, so then my calculator gave me 10380. So is that what y'all got? Okay. So so that means that in 2015 the population is a little over um, 10,000. So any question about part one? So now part two. Of the same exercise. is uh, find when the population is 15,000. Okay, so now what's being requested? P. So that's not what's being requested, that's what's being, being given. What year? Right, so now the previous one is on um, these two lines, it, 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 it amounted to, here we have a model that has two variables in it, two symbols, P and T. And I gave you T, find P. That was the previous exercise. The present one is I gave you which one? P. And I want you to find which one? T. T. So given P is 15,000, find T. <clears throat> okay. So this, this one is actually quite short in comparison to the previous one because we did all the hard work making the linear model. Okay, so 15,000 is 380 T minus big number. Okay. So seven seven zero three two zero is three hundred eighty T. So I moved this to the other side. Now I'll divide by three hundred eighty. <coughs> and I obtain two zero two seven. Point one six ish is T. <clears throat> so does that does that seem reasonable? What would that be saying? Right. In about twenty twenty seven the population will be um, around fifteen thousand. Okay. So the answer to the question is in the year twenty twenty seven.
Any question about this exercise? Yes? If you were to put the uh, 0.16 at the end of it, would that be considered wrong? Uh, <clears throat> if <clears throat> when I give you a, such an exercise, I'll be very precise about exactly what I want. So I'll say, give me the, you know, give me the answer to the nearest year or something like that. <clears throat> Okay, so now, the good thing about this exercise is literally every exercise in this section is exactly like this. They're all exactly the same. They, they're, it's simply not possible from, for them to vary in any way. Because, it's, because if, you're assuming, if you're assuming that what you're modeling, you're modeling inputs and outputs linearly, then once you have a point and a slope, you know every single thing that there is to know. I can't possibly ask you anything else. And in the end, the questions always come down to, what is the output if this is the input? And then I can say, okay, then if this is the input, then what was the output? You know, it's just, there's only so many ways I can say it. Or I can say, if this was the output, what was the input? And it, so every single one of the exercises is exactly the same. I give you some data somehow in some silly story that's totally unreasonable, <laughs> like saying that population is going to grow linearly, and somehow I give you two points, or I give you a point in the slope or something. Okay, so any question about that section? Okay, so now we're going to move to the next section. Which is 5.1. Uh, quadratic functions. Okay, so definition. So a quadratic function is exactly what you think it is. So a quadratic function <coughs> is any function of the form f of x is <coughs> ax squared plus bx plus c and there's exactly one requirement about a b and c what are the requ what is the requirement Well, they're assumed to be real. So yes, I agree that they're real. Is that A can't be zero. That's the only re requirement. Why, why are we going to require that A is not zero? Well, so if A was zero, that term wouldn't be there. And then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a quadratic. When you look at it, if you were to plot it, it wouldn't be bendy. It'd be straight. Okay, so then A can be negative. It can be positive, it just can't be zero. Okay, <clears throat> so to the standard quadratic <clears throat> is this function f of x is x squared, which is to say it's, you take the, the most general form of the quadratic and you say, okay, I'm going to say that a is 1 and b is 0 and c is 0. So 1, 0, and 0. So this is called the standard quadratic, and this is one of the functions that's in the list of families of functions that you require to memorize, how they look. So its appearance is this. So it's, it's a power function with even exponent. So that means that it has like, it has two arms and the arms are either one up and one down or, or, or both up. So which one is it? Both up. So it looks like this. <coughs> OK. 
Okay, and this shape, this characteristic shape, is called a parabola. <coughs> now, this point at the bottom, Gesundheit, this point at the bottom is of much importance, so important that it has its own name. So this is called the vertex. Most of this section is going to be now done by the following. Is we're going to say, okay, we can. We learned in pr previous lectures how to transform functions. That is to say, how to move them around, okay, and, and reflect them up and down and all kinds of stuff. So what we're going to do, honestly, for most of the rest of the section, is we're going to say, here's the standard quadratic, and what if we transform it around a lot? Where did the vertex go? So it's just going to be, where did the vertex go? Where did that blue point go? Blah, 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 every time. OK. <coughs> so three. So 3.1. So what if we consider the following? We say f of x is x minus h squared. So this is not the standard quadratic anymore. But how is it similar to the standard quadratic? Or? It's the same parabola shape you're moving the vertex. Yeah, the vertex has been moved horizontally. Because what this represents, this represents the transformation from y is x squared. This one is the standard parabola. That's the standard one. And we transformed it like this. y is x minus h squared. So which variable did we play with? The x. So that means that a horizontal transformation has occurred. So is it a horizontal shift or a horizontal scale? A shift because it's subtraction, not, multipli not division. So, the net result of this, <coughs> assuming that h is a positive value, uh, is that we just move the vertex over here uh, to, to, to horizontal position h. OK. <clears throat> so what if, what if instead of that, we say, OK, well, how about this one? This is also something that's similar, but not the same as the standard parabola. So now what does this do? It shifts the vertex up now. Because what's happening is we could consider the standard parabola. So that's the standard parabola, the standard quadratic. And then now we'll transform it like this. y is x squared plus k. And the question sort of is, is well, which, which which variable is the k playing with? Is, is k playing with x or, or with y? It kind of looks like x right now because it's over by the x. But to be, to be actually playing with the x, it would need to be inside of the squaring where the x actually is, but it's not. So let's, let's move the k over here. And now you can see, ah, yes, it was y that was played with. y became y minus k, and x didn't move at all. So <coughs> the net result is that we took, the, we took the standard parabola, and we pulled the coordinate system down k. Or, if you like, we pushed the parabola up k.
Okay. <clears throat> so now we can we can do even something else. So how about <clears throat> 3.3. How about f of x is a times x squared? <clears throat> so that's almost the same as the standard parabola. What what difference did I? What what distinction is there? Yeah, I put the I put that a there. Okay. <clears throat> so this is like y is x squared transforms to y is a x squared and the question is as well were we playing with the with the a, were we playing with x's or with y's well to to say that it's playing with the x's that that would mean that the a needs to be inside of the square with x is a inside of the square with x it isn't it isn't it it would it would need to be like ax squared, but it isn't. Uh, so I'll move the a over here by the y. And now you can see, ah, so this is a vertical transformation because it's playing with the y. Is it a vertical shift or a scale? Scale because this is division. So that means that <coughs> We're going to take the parabola and stretch it out. So if a is a is a is bigger than one, bigger than one, that means that the parabola is going to be taller. If a is between zero and one, that means that the parabola will be shorter. So it'll be squashed flat, flatter. If a is negative, then what? It'll be a vertical reflection. It'll reflect the parabola down. So I'm going to draw the two scenarios, <coughs> two different scenarios. <coughs> so how does this move the vertex? It doesn't move the vertex, right? Because a vertical reflection or scale doesn't move the vertex. So the vertex will be unmoved. If A was positive, then somehow it'll make the parabola taller or shorter. But it will be qualitatively quite similar. If A is negative, it, this will now be going down. Okay, <clears throat> so now I can write the punchline to this page. <clears throat> the punchline to this page is that this is called the standard form. So uh, the <clears throat> standard form of a quadratic function is f of x is a x minus h squared plus k. So that is when we do all three of these transformations. Every single quadratic that there is can be obtained from the standard quadratic by doing a combination of these three transformations. So where is the vertex of this quadratic? Right, so, so but you should be able to read it off for me in terms of the letters A, H, and K. So it's at H, K. So the majority of questions in this section are going to be of the following, um, are, are going to be basically the following. This right here 
is the definition of a quadratic function. So is this, is this formula written in standard form? It's not written in standard form, right? <coughs> so this is standard form. The majority of the questions on, in this section are going to be, is I'm going to give you one of these, I'm going to give it to you like this, and the question in the end is going to be, I want you to give it back to me like that. So I give you this one, a quadra quadratic function that is not in standard form. You perform some work, and then give it back to me in standard form. <coughs> okay. So we haven't we haven't done an, a question yet, but is there any? We haven't done an exercise yet, but is there any question about what we said? Okay. So this is this is like a, a seek and find. It's going to be find the vertex, <laughs> is is what we're doing. Okay. <coughs> So suppose I give you the following. <clears throat> I say, uh, let let f of x be five x squared minus thirty x plus seventy three. So, is this a quadratic function? Yes. What are a, b, and c? 5, negative 30, and 73. Very good. So, my request of you is put f in standard form. So, is it in standard form? It is not. Right? That is to say, I want you to perform some work so that in the end, it looks like a x minus h squared plus k. Perform some work until it looks like this. <coughs> okay, which raises the question, just exactly how do you perform that work? So you already know how. It's something that you, it's been missing in your life, your college algebra life for the last two weeks or so. It's not factoring, not the quadratic formula, but it's something you're getting warmer. How are we going to do it? We're going to complete the square. Ah, that's what's been missing. <laughs> Surely you have that feeling now. Oh yeah, that's what was missing in my life. <laughs> now, I feel, now I feel better that we're going to do that. <clears throat> Good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so complete the square. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to take this, this function, f of x, and the way completing the square goes is we're going to collect all the terms with x together and then move away all the terms without x. So I'm going to collect them like this. So here's 5x squared and then minus 30x. So we've collected the terms with x. And then I'm going to separate out the terms without x. OK. <clears throat> so now, when we complete the square, the technique that we use always we're always completing the square on a monic qu quadratic. Is this quadratic monic? It is not monic. So what does it mean for a quadratic, for, for a polynomial to be monic? The leading coefficient needs to be 1. What is, what is presently the leading coefficient? 5. So how are we going to fix this? Well, yes, we'll factor out the 5. So now we have a 5. And then what is in here now is x squared minus 6x and then plus 73. OK, so now we've accomplished two things. We've, we've got the terms with x by themselves, and also the terms with x are now monic. So now what? Very good. So. The, what we're going to do is inside of these square parentheses, we're going to judiciously add 0. And we're going to be a little bit 
a little bit cl clever about how we're going to do it. Okay, we're going to add zero. <coughs> I'm showing all this, the steps in their gory detail, but you don't need to show your, you don't need to be quite so verbose when you do it. I'm just trying to remind you in case you've forgotten about this. So yes, we're going to add some amount, half of some amount, and square it, and then we're going to subtract the same. So what goes in the numerator there? B. B. Okay. That is to say, this number. Okay, so negative 6 over 2 is negative 3. Or, uh, yeah, negative 3. Square that is 9. So what we're saying is that for some reason, we're finding it quite convenient to add 9 and then subtract 9. <clears throat> we're going to add 9 and then subtract 9. Terrific. So now the reason why that is useful to us is because inside of the square parentheses, the first three terms are now a square. That is to say they can be written as something squared. So what specifically? X minus 3 all squared. So now we can distribute the 5 into the square parentheses to mul multiply it in, into it. So this would be 5x minus 3 squared, and then 5 times 9 is 45, so minus 45, and then plus 73. And then we can, we can do this bit of arithmetic. That would be what? 33 minus 5 is 28. So 5x minus 3 <coughs> squared plus 28. So have we satisfied the objective of the question? Like yes, right, we have. Okay, so where is the vertex? So I'll say that that's question one. So question one is put it in standard form. Question two is please find the vertex of the parabola. Three twenty-eight. There's no no work to do really. <laughs> you did all the work right up there. Okay, good. Any question about this? So now I could say, well, please, um, please give a rough sketch of how this would look. Sketch has a C in it. <clears throat> well, so there's three things that have occurred to the standard parabola. There's three things that have occurred. The vertex moved because we did some shifting. Where is, so the vertex moved to 328. So that means that the vertex is like way up here. So that's 328. What else happened? So it vertically scaled by 5. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that it reflected down? Did it reflect down? No. Yeah, it got a lot steeper. It's like it was stretched out vertically. So something like this.
Beautiful. So now what if I was to say, you know, I'm not going to just yet, but soon I will. I could say something like, suppose that this is your cost function. We have a business and we sell grape flavored hammers or whatever it is that we're selling. And our cost is determined by this, by this quadratic. Where is our cost minimized? At the vertex. At the vertex. So supposing that I gave you this question, but I gave it to you upside down, and I said that suppose that the profit of us selling our free range park benches or whatever it is that we sell <coughs> is given by this quadratic, that our profit is. How do we maximize our profit? It's maximized at the vertex, right? So this is going to be, the mo for us, for our purposes, the most useful thing about quadratics is that we will always be able to find the vertex, and the vertex is always the minimizer or the maximizer. And this quadratic, it has a minimizer but no maximizer. This quadratic has a maximizer but no minimizer. So I could ask you a question. I could say something like this. <coughs> I could say, um, how about this one? If I was to sketch this parabola for you, is this a reasonable, is this a reasonable um, profit function? No, right? This is not reasonable because it's not bounded above. And this would mean that your profit is unbounded. No, that's not reasonable. Furthermore, furthermore, the profit is, is bounded below by a positive number. That would mean that no matter what, you would profit. It, do, it literally does not matter what you do. So this, is, this does not represent a reasonable profit function. Yes? So, um, it will always be a positive, even though it's <coughs> like negative. So it's x minus 3. So it will always just be 3. Like I'm not sure I follow your question. So for the vertex. So, so... When you look at this, the, the vertex is at HK. Mm -hmm. So because, because of this, when you match the, these two together, H is 3. Mm -hmm. And because when you match these, K is 28. Now, I think your question might be, why is it that this one is negative? Why is it this one is minus H and this one is plus K? Is that your question? Like what would happen if it was X plus H? OK, let's, let's draw one in the time remaining. So, so we still have 90 seconds, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use them. <laughs> okay. So if I was to give you, say, P of X is <coughs> negative 2, X plus 4 squared, and then, say, plus 10. Okay, then my question to you is, is where is the vertex? So where is it? Would it be uh, 4 times? No. Negative 4. Negative 4. Is it because when you take it out, it's, it's negative? It's the opposite of what it is? Right. It's because when you take the standard parabola mm -hmm. and you add 4 to the coordinate system, you're moving the coordinate system to the right. Um. So that means that the parabola is moving to the left. Or you, you could say it like you said, it's the opposite, I guess. But okay. that, I, I, I like to not, I, I don't like to say that because that kind of yeah. might lose the, the significance of, of why it is that way. Okay. So if we were to sketch this, just to give a quick sketch, in which quadrant would the, would the vertex fall? The top left one, right? Correct? So it would be up here-ish. And this parabola, would it open up or down? Why would it open down? Yeah, because the it has been vertically scaled by negative 2. So it will reflect down and be stretched by 2. So this one opens down like a frown. Right? Sometimes uh, I like to do this. It's a sad parabola. Down like a frown. Okay, so have a nice uh, Wednesday.